Right? Now, please take out your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter, over the last two months, we've been going through this series and the study of the book of 2 Peter, and we're looking at the big picture as Peter is communicating now. An old man who's about to die, he knows his time is short, and God is working in and through him, wanting the church to be taught and reminded of some big picture issues. We're in chapter three. We've only got two lessons left this morning and next week. And then in a couple weeks, we're gonna go through the book of Jonah together. But as we're finishing through this series, we start in the third chapter in verse one, and you can follow on the screen if you don't have your Bible. We're gonna read verses one through 10. Peter writes, dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming that he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness, but he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Wow. What a powerful passage. Peter is writing to the church of his day, and to ours, 2,000 years later. And Peter is saying, before I die, God wants to use me to write you and to remind you of some very important things. I want you to get the big picture on four very critical areas that's going to affect each of your lives. First, he says, I want you to get the big picture of salvation and what it means and how to have it. Secondly, he wrote about the big picture of the scriptures, the Bible, and its importance in our lives. Just before the Easter break, we saw that Peter says, I want you to understand the big picture of spiritual teachers and God's desire for you to be fed and taught the truth. And today we're coming to the last big issue that God wants us to be reminded of, and that is the issue of future events. Future events, what it's going to be like down the road and what we should expect and what God's attitude and purposes are in all of this. And he does this in the most interesting way when he starts this whole topic by saying, dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. And we've taken a close look at both 1 Peter and now 2 Peter. He says, I've written both of these letters as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. The word stimulate is an interesting one in the original Greek language. It's the word that literally means to stir up. Have you ever gone to the refrigerator in the morning and gotten out a pitcher of orange juice and it's kind of separated in the day and you got to stir it up to make it all right again? Or have you had a fire in a fireplace or at a campfire and it kind of burns down to coals and you need to stir up the coals to make it flame up again? That's exactly the thought that Peter is communicating. Communicating here. He's writing to stir up, to stimulate, 
to bring to fire again and balance all these important truths that God wants us to have in our spiritual lives. These things that he describes that will bring us to wholesome thinking. And that's an interesting phrase. When we hear the word wholesome, we might tend to think that he's simply saying he wants us to be moral people, but that's not nearly at all what he's describing here. The phrase wholesome thinking is made up of two separate Greek words. The first word is elekrines, and the second one is dianoia. Elekrines is an interesting word. In the ancient world, when somebody was making uh, a pot or a cup or something that would be able to hold water or a fluid in it, they would make it and sometimes it would get a crack in it in the process of firing it and finishing it. And they would, by necessity, have to throw it away. But the unscrupulous guys who were making these would say, you know, I don't really want to lose my profits and throw that away. And what they'd do is they'd fill in the crack with, with wax. And so when somebody was looking for a good pot or a cup or a bowl or something, they would have to check it out to make sure that there wasn't a crack in it. And what they'd do is they'd hold that up to the sunlight to see if it was, there was any shimmer in the finish. Now, that word elecrines literally means to hold up to the sun. And Peter is writing and saying the word doyen, and so it communicates a sense of being genuine or real or authentic. The word dianoia simply means to have a thought process or understanding. Peter's writing and saying, I'm sending all this information to you. I'm writing about these big picture issues because I want your theology to not have any cracks in it. I want your mindset and understanding about spiritual things to be completely whole. So it's not so much an issue of morality as it is understanding what God's plans and purposes are for our lives. And he's communicating this in the most powerful way when he says, now here's the point. I want you to have a clear, genuine, whole, and complete understanding of the big picture of what's coming ahead, of what God's purposes are in time and in each of our lives. And he says this in the most emphatic way when in verse 3 he says, you must understand this. It's not just an option, another piece of knowledge that we, oh, I may read this book, I may read that, I may watch this show, I may watch that, oh, I've got so many choices. No, it's not a, simply an option, it's an expectation. You must, and if you have your, your Bibles and you take notes, underline, that word is emphatic. You must understand this to have a complete picture, a full understanding of what God is doing. How he is moving in your lives. How he's moving in the world at large. You must understand. And he says there are two things that you have to remember. Two things that are absolutely critical as we're thinking about the big picture of future things. The first is that there are always going to be mockers. There are always going to be people who ridicule our faith. It was so interesting that... Just last night, I was sharing this message, and somebody sent me a text saying, you have no idea how much I needed that. All weekend long, I've been, a family member is just making fun of me for following Christ. Wow, maybe that happens to you at work or at school, in your neighborhood, in your family. People who, it feels like their whole purpose in life is just to make fun of us because we choose to follow Christ. People like Christopher Hitchens. Some of you may remember that name, Christopher Hitchens, a very famous atheist. He'd travel around the world doing lectures, just ridiculing, vilifying anything to do with faith and Christianity. What was so interesting was Christopher Hitchens' brother David was a, is a believer, and they used to do debates together in public forums here in America and England. Christopher Hitchens once said, I think religion should be treated with ridicule, hatred, and contempt. And I claim that right. And man, did he exercise it everywhere he went. There will always be mockers. There will always be people who, who ridicule our faith and 
each of us because we choose to follow Christ. And Peter is writing to those of us who experience that rejection, who experience the brunt of that ridicule and saying, don't forget this. I want you to remember the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets. I want you to remember the command that was given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. You must understand that in the last days, scoffers are going to come, scoffing, following their own evil desires. They're going to say, oh, where is that coming? Oh, Jesus is coming. Where is this coming that he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything's been going on and on and on ever since the, the beginning of time, ever since the beginning of creation. Nothing ever changes. Really? But the Bible teaches us that Jesus is coming again. The Bible teaches us in the context of this study. I don't know if you ever watch any of the late night shows, uh, comedians and different ones. I mean, I don't know a single one that's on television that is a follower of Jesus or even has a biblical worldview. But I don't know any of them that vilify, I mean, deliberate. It's almost like they take every opportunity to ridicule our faith any more than Bill Maher. He's one of the most vicious anti-Christian people I've ever seen. In the context of our study is we're thinking in terms about Jesus returning, setting all things right, ultimately defeating Satan. He says, really, that's nothing more than, than a joke. In fact, Bill Maher once said, religion, it's just the ultimate hustle. And he goes, why can't God just defeat the devil right now? If God was really all that powerful, if God was really all that good, why doesn't he just get rid of Satan right now? And then he answers his own question, why God doesn't do this. He says, the truth is, in his mind, it's the same reason a comic book character can't defeat his nemesis. Because then there wouldn't be any story left. For those of us who grew up watching Batman, I know I'm dating myself, but he's simply saying Batman, even though he fought the Joker all the time, he never really got rid of the Joker. He never really got rid of the Riddler or Penguin or any of the other. Because if he got rid of them, there wouldn't be any story left. There wouldn't be anyone left to fight. Bill Maher is saying that God is nothing more than a comic book character and Satan is just another one of the characters that he has to fight. And if he got rid of Satan, then there wouldn't be any story left. And all of this stuff that we believe is nothing but comic book story. Friends, let me tell you, one of the clearest, clearest teachings in all of the Bible is the glorious, visible, and final return of Christ to the earth. It's found over and over and over in the Bible, both the Old and the New Testaments. Would it surprise you to know, not just the first coming, but even the second coming is one of the clearest teachings in Scripture. One out of every 30 verses in the Bible mentions the glorious, visible, and bodily return of Christ to the earth. Over 300 separate references are found in the Bible that describe Jesus coming a second time. 23 of the 27 New Testament books all speak of the Lord's return. And it's not just a New Testament truth. In the Old Testament, we have the same truths that are taught over and over, whether you're looking at the book of Job or the writings of David or Isaiah, Jeremiah, or any of the minor prophets. There is such a deliberate emphasis on Christ's return. You cannot deny it. And it doesn't, frankly, it doesn't matter what anyone believes about it. It's going to happen. God has declared it. That same Jesus that came 2,000 years ago, who was the God-man, who went to the cross, suffered for our sins, was buried, rose from the grave, rose into heaven, that same Jesus is coming back someday. Over and over and over this truth is realized and read. In Acts chapter 1, when the disciples were standing there having that last interaction with Jesus, and all of a sudden, he starts floating up into the air. <gasps> they're standing there. Their mouths are wide open. They're looking up into heaven, trying to get that last glimpse. And suddenly, there are two angels that are standing there. And the angels say to them, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? 
Don't you understand? Don't you remember this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven is going to come back in the very same way that you've seen him go into heaven. Jesus taught of his second coming over and over with the disciples. When he was describing this in Luke chapter 21 and what the end times would be like, he said, when I come back at that time, everybody who is living in that generation when I return, everyone will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When the apostle John was given this incredible vision of heaven, and all of the future events that were taking place. At the end of the book, as Jesus is emphatically highlighting, he says, listen, all of that's true, but the most important thing I want you to remember is, I am coming back, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people, every single person according to their deeds, whether it's good or bad, I'm coming back and I am going to be the judge. That's why the Apostle Paul writes of us, the church. And he says, every one of us are waiting for the blessed hope. We are waiting for the appearance and the glory of, of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. We live and look forward to this every single day. In Revelation, it's so interesting. It, it both starts and ends with the promise of Jesus' return. And in chapter 1, it is so emphatic that it's said three different times in three different ways. First, in verse 7, he says, look, he's writing to each of us, look, he, Jesus, is coming in the clouds, and every eye is going to see him. I don't know how that's going to happen. When Jesus comes back, every single person who is living in that time, in that generation, no matter what part of the earth they're in, somehow they're going to see it happening. He tells us once to expect him. He's coming and every eye will see him. But then he gives a second statement. So it shall be. He emphasizes and makes it emphatic. And even beyond that, if that's not enough, he says, Amen. It shall happen. Wow. Oh, wow. You know, everybody today has this crazy idea uh, some idea about how it's all going to end out there. And you know, I love watching apocalyptic movies. I mean, I, I love it because they're just so, so outlandish at times. And it doesn't matter what movie you're watching. They all have these different ideas of how it's going to end. Oh, there's going to be an atmospheric change. And it's either going to be freezing or it's going to be cold. There's going to be some kind of a virus that's going to happen. And we're going to be all wiped away. And oh, all the, uh, we're going to have visitors from outer space that are going to come. All of these different ideas, of course, you know that my favorite, and I'm almost that close to believing it, it's there's going to be a zombie invasion, you know? All of these things, these ideas that people have, that's how it's going to end. Folks, let me tell you, the Bible is absolutely clear how all of this is going to end. The Bible is absolutely clear that Jesus is coming back that Jesus is going to set all of this straight. Did we lose the screen? There we go. Oh, it's running through again. I know, you just wanted to see the zombie thing one more time. I, you know, let me say while well, it's getting there. I'm not even worried about the zombies as long as, um, what's his name, the actor is alive. If it's invasions from outer space, I want Tom Cruise with me. But if it, Brad Pitt, if it's zombies, I want Brad Pitt there to help me through this, all right? Peter writes, and he says, these people who believe all these crazy theories, who reject biblical truth, they deliberately forget. They deliberately, now how do you deliberately forget something? I, <laughs> you know, quite honestly, at 61, I don't have to deliberately forget anything. <laughs> I am forgetting everything left and right these days. But the idea of deliberate forgetfulness is really the way we would communicate that they willingly ignore or they willingly block out something that they don't want to have to deal with. 
these people are willingly blacking out. They are willingly ignoring that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. That these waters were used to judge the earth in Noah's time. And that the same great word of power that created all things and brought judgment, that same word is going to take the present heavens and earth that are reserved for fire. There's going to be a cleansing, a judgment, and a cleansing, and a recreation, and all that are ungodly will be caught up in that tide. He's saying, folks, understand this. Don't ignore it. Unbelievers who reject the scripture truth forget that it was all created by God's great, powerful word. They forget that God brought judgment on the world once already by the word of his power. And that one day, and they willingly block out, they willingly ignore that God is going to have Jesus return and judge the world by that same great word of power. And he presents his truth in the most dramatic way when he says the day of the Lord is going to come. The day of the Lord is going to come. It's going to come like a thief, unexpected. When it's going to happen, boom, it happens. And the heavens are going to disappear with a roar. The elements are going to be destroyed by fire. There's going to be judgment. There's going to be cleansing that takes place. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And all of this is going to be done, and it's all going to be laid bare. And man, it's going to be overwhelming. People say, well, when's it going to happen? How is it going to happen? And quite honestly, this is one of the most challenging aspects of studying God's word and trying to understand this. How does it all work and when? And trying to get this is, I've often shared with you, I love the study of prophecy, but there are challenges to prophecy, these promises of future things. When you study prophecy, it's kind of like looking across mountain peaks. Each one of the promises of God represent the top of the mountain. And when you're looking across mountain peaks, you can see the tops of the mountains, but you have trouble because you can't see the valley in between. You don't know what the distance is. You don't know what's in the valley. And sometimes we have the same challenge with prophecy. When you're looking and God hasn't given us encyclopedic knowledge about how much time there is between the peaks and the promises, he doesn't tell us how it's all filled in. All we can see are across the peaks. And God has given us all these incredible promises regarding Christ's return. And he hasn't given us every piece of knowledge to be able to understand what the time distance is between the peaks and what's going to happen in between. And because of that, there are two primary schools of thought as to how things are all going to play out. Let me take just a moment and share what those two schools of thought are. The first one, and many of you have come from this religious background or theological background, it's called covenant theology. Covenant theology is the belief that when man turned away from God, God created this covenant of grace that he invited mankind to as he is building his kingdom. And since the time of the cross, the kingdom of God has continued growing. And the idea within covenant theology is that the kingdom of God is just going to keep on growing and it's going to prepare the whole world for Christ's visible and glorious return. In covenant theology, there is no, there's no plan for Israel to have a predominant role again. All individuals within Judaism may come to Christ. Israelites may get saved. But it's not that God has a unique plan for them. They will just be a part of the church like anybody else. There's no distinctive time period where God is going to specifically work through Israel as he once did. Then Jesus will come back. He'll establish the final judgments and then the purification of the heavens and the earth and we'll, we'll all move into eternity. That's the first system of theology that is based on these future events. Now, the second school of thought is what's called dispensationalism. 
Dispensationalism simply means that there are time frames or dispensations when God is working in unique ways through people. He gives a, a level of knowledge and understanding in which we can be redeemed and how that all works together. And in each of these time periods, God is working uniquely. Some in covenant theology differ as to whether that covenant of grace started with Abraham or all the way back to Adam, but that was when the church was formed in covenant theology. We believe that Jesus established the church as a unique time period and dispensation, if you will, when he said to Peter and the disciples, I'm going to build my church on you. And the church is going to be uniquely different than my relationship with Israel was. And this church age that we've been in has lasted for 2,000 years. We have no idea how much longer it's going to go, but as we study the scripture, where covenant theology takes uh, certain events that are recorded or prophesied and says that those are symbols, if you will, and they're interpreted figuratively, we say no, there are literal events that are still yet to come, that God isn't finished with Israel, that God has a plan for the Israelite nation, and and yet there's going to be a time of judgment and purification that is recognized in Matthew 24, Daniel 9, Jeremiah, through all these important passages. It'll be seven years that we call the tribulation. And then at the last half of it will be a purification and a revival for Israel as a nation. And that God will then establish a millennial kingdom, a thousand years where Jesus is ruling from Jerusalem on the throne of David. And that comes from a very literal interpretation of Revelation 20 that says a thousand years. It's not just the kingdom that we're in now, but there will be a distinct period in which God is going to raise up Israel again and give them a unique place of honor and that God will bless them and work through them again. Based on Romans chapter 11, Daniel 2, Ezekiel 36, all these wonderful Old Testament promises that God gave to the Israelite nation. We believe that all of this is going to happen now. Without hesitation, I hold to dispensationalism. I take a very literal understanding of these promises that God gave both to the church and to Israel, as opposed to the more figurative understanding within covenant theology. But can I tell you the truth? Neither one of these are a hill I'm going to die on. Neither one of them. Good people differ on this. Our our denomination, the Evangelical Free Church, is based primarily on a more literal dispensational understanding of Scripture. But even, even within our denomination, there are changes that are happening. In our statement of faith, it declares that we believe that Jesus is coming back before the kingdom. That's premillennial return. But this year, there's a consideration on the table to take the word premillennialism out of our statement of faith and simply focus on the glorious return because whether you are covenant in your, your understanding or dispensational, what we both agree on is that one day Jesus is coming back. We agree and understand scripture that that visible return of Christ is going to be glorious, that the whole world is going to see it. He's going to come in great power. And that description is found in Revelation 19 as we have this writing of John describing what it's like when Jesus comes back. And he writes and says, Then I saw a heaven opened and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True. This is Jesus. For he judges fairly and he wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire and his, on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. And he wore a robe dipped in blood. This is a picture of his death and suffering for us. And his title was the word of God. Jesus is the living word. Wow! He pushes on and he says, the armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed Jesus on white horses and from his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the almighty, like, like juice flowing from a wine press. And on his thigh 
was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Wow! I, this is the glorious return that we wait for. And somebody, you know, when's it going to happen? I don't know when it's all going to happen, all right? But I am absolutely committed to the fact that it is going to happen. Whether I believe it or not, it's going to happen. But folks, let me tell you, absolutely, my whole life is built, it, it is all hinging on these truths. On a door hinge, you probably have three hinges at home on your doors. And the three hinges to my life are, number one, Jesus, the God-man, suffered and paid the penalty for my sins. The second hinge is that that same Jesus rose from the grave bodily. He's in heaven today in that glorified state. And the third hinge is that one day that same Jesus is coming back. Now, folks, I'm telling you, you could take everything that I have away from me. You could take my house, my car, my family, everything that I have in this world that seems important or dear to my life, and it take it all away, and I'm going to be okay. But if you take away these three hinges, I have nothing left. I have nothing left. My life is wrapped up in the firm belief that one day Jesus is coming back. When is he coming? I don't know. To be quite honest with you, I hope he comes before I have to take my Spanish test tomorrow, all right? I, just being honest with you. It may happen today, before I get home. It may happen 100 years from now. That's, that's not the important thing. When it happens... But it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Peter writes, there's always going to be people who make fun. Always going to be somebody who mocks you, ridicules you for your faith. It's okay. It's okay. When you wonder, why is God waiting so long? People have said, you know, it's been 2,000 years. Peter answers that issue. He says, God always has a plan. Remember, God always has a plan. Don't forget, he says in the strongest terms. And, and what's interesting is he's writing to the church. And in the Greek language, this is an, what we call an aorist imperative, a past tense imperative verb that doesn't just mean don't forget as if you might. He's saying to people, stop forgetting. Stop forgetting that all of this is true. Stop forgetting that Jesus is coming back. When it seems like it's been a long time, don't forget with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. He's, he's talking about the nature of God's existence, that God lives outside of the realm of time. In eternity, God is not affected by time as we are. See, you and I live in the present. Everything in the past is nothing but a memory. Everything in the future is nothing but a hope. The only thing that we really experience is the present what's happening right now, how I feel. But God's not like us. God lives in the realm beyond time called eternity. And God lives all the time in the past, present, and future, all at the same time. God experiences what happened in the past as if it's the present. God experiences what will be in the future as if it's the present. How he does that, I don't know. I mean, that just, my mind isn't big enough to wrap around something that infinite and eternal. But God, so a thousand years to God is nothing. It's a breath. A breath is a thousand years. It's, it's okay. But God is speaking now to us. And he says, don't you forget that even though it feels like it's been a long time, God is at work accomplishing his plan. God isn't slow in keeping his promises as, as some of us understand slowness. Oh man, it's been 2,000 years. No. God, if there is one thing that Peter is challenging us, it's to remember that God always, always, always keeps his promises. God always keeps his promises. I love how in Ezekiel chapter 12, he presents his truth when he says, I, the Lord, will speak, and whatever word I speak will be performed. 
I will speak the word and I will perform it, declares the Lord God. God always, always, always keeps his promises. One pastor named Colin Urquhart puts it this way. God is the God of promise. He keeps his word even when that seems impossible. Even when all of the circumstances around us seem to point to the opposite. God is going to keep his promise. Jesus is going to come. So what's he waiting for? Peter says, get the big picture. Understand why it's taken so long from our frame point. And he gives us that when he says, stop forgetting. And in verse 9, here's what you need to remember. That God is patient with you. God is not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. That's what God's doing. Many of us learn this verse in the King James language, and we remember the words that God is not willing that anyone should perish. The word will or want is an interesting word. When you study the original language of the Bible, the, or the New Testament, the Greek language, there are actually two separate words that are translated with the word will or to want in the English language. One of those words is the word boule, which we find in this verse. And the other one is thelema. And there's, there's something similar and there's something different between each of those words. They're similar in the fact that they both communicate something that's wanted or desired. But there are nuances that make these two words very different. Kenneth Weiss is one of the greatest of the Bible scholars and translators. And Kenneth Weiss describes the difference between boule and thelema by saying, boule is a desire that's based on reason, but thelema is a desire that's based on the heart. Let me illustrate it this way. You guys, you can identify with me on this. If you were looking for a wife, would you look for one that makes your heart flutter? Oh, man, she is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. Every time I see her, I just, oh, I, I, I'm speechless. I, I get near her, my heart flutters. She is so good looking. Oh, wow. Or do you look for a woman who says, you look, man, now, she would make a good housewife. Now, she would be good with the bills to take care of those things. She's a good planner. Man, I'll bet she could take care of the house and our lives pretty well. Which would you look for? I'd look for both, to be honest with you. I mean, I'll find one in the same package. <laughs> right? Now, it's absolutely true that when God looks at us, his heart flutters. He loves us. He's filled with mercy and grace and love. But in the context of this passage, it's not the fluttering heart that is the focus. It's the plan. God reached out to us because from the very beginning of time, before time even existed, before the world was ever created, God knew that people were going to turn away from him. God knew that there would need to be a plan of redemption, that a sacrifice would have to be made. God wanted to have a kingdom of followers that were part of that unique kingdom and family because they chose and loved him too. And from the very beginning, God had a plan and has been working that plan so that he could provide a way for us to be saved through Jesus and so that now we would come to him and that every single person who has been chosen for salvation and will choose him will have the opportunity to come. God's been working the plan, working the plan. And he says, when I'm done with the plan at just the right time, then that's going to be the end. But until then, because I want to reach people, I want to bring people into the kingdom, I want people to be saved, I'm just waiting, waiting, waiting for those people who are going to receive me. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And so this great, all-powerful, but loving God is working the plan to bring us to him, to give us the opportunity to be saved, to have a relationship with him that is infinitely, eternally good. But Peter says, 
That's the plan that God is working. But you have a responsibility in all of this. And it brings us to a point of personal challenge. And that personal challenge is if God is working the plan to build a kingdom of people who will receive him and love him and follow him, serve him, then when Jesus comes back, are we going to be ready? Are we individually going to be ready? A.W. Tozer, the great preacher and Bible scholar, said when Jesus returns, is that nearly as, as important as the fact that we're ready for him when he does return? When Jesus is coming, is that nearly as important as that I'm ready for him when he comes? Because I've chosen to put my faith in Jesus. I've chosen to be a faithful follower. That God is at work in me and through me. And he gives us that choice. See, in love, he reaches out to us. But he also lets us choose how we're going to respond. One pastor has put it this way when he said that the road to hell is blocked by two arms spread wide at the cross. And the cross provides a way for every person to be saved. But if the offer is ignored, if the provision for salvation is rejected, love, eternal love, God can only weep as a man pushes his way into a Christless eternity. I'm so grateful. I am so grateful that God reached out to me. He didn't have to, but he did. I'm so grateful that in my rebellion and moral blindness and the sinfulness and contamination of my life, there is a God who not only was systematically working to reach me, but he was doing it in love, 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 love. And he said, Steve, I care about you. I want you in my kingdom. Jesus communicated that, that passionate, fluttering heart of God who was working the plan when he said to Nicodemus, and these words are so familiar to us, most of us have memorized this as children, for God so loved the world. Take the word world away and put your name there. For God so loved Steve Miller. For God so loved each of you that in his plan he sent Jesus, his one and only son, that if Steve Miller and each of us would simply believe to put our trust in Jesus, we would not perish but could have eternal life. Have you come to that point in your life yet? I know most of us have. But in a room this full, there may be somebody who has not yet really come to this point where you have fully surrendered yourself to the call of Jesus in your life. That you, you have been a moral person. You have been a good person. You've been a religious person, a kind person, a generous person, a religious person. But have you come to the point of recognizing that the only hope for our salvation is by placing our trust in Jesus? Our sin sacrifice, who died, rose, is in heaven today, and is one day coming for us. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads for just a moment. Have you come to that point in your life where you received that Jesus as your Savior, the one who is coming back and wants you to be with him forever? It's as simple as saying, God, I believe that when Jesus died, he paid the penalty for my sins. He offers me forgiveness and eternal life. I believe that that Jesus who died rose from the grave. He's alive today. And one day that that same Jesus is coming back as the scriptures promise. And I choose 
to receive that Jesus and follow him through this life and all eternity. Father, thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your love, for the plan that made it possible for us to be saved. God, today, we're just overwhelmed that you would choose us, that you would reach out to us, that you would draw us to yourself and give us new life. And so we say thank you. Thank you. And we choose to follow you, and we do it gladly. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.